Hello everyone and welcome to The Curiosity Show, the show that widens your knowledge of the world around you. I'm Lara. And I'm Megan and today is day two of the Nottingham Festival of Science and Curiosity. The festival is a whole week celebrating all things science and we're here to show you some of the weird and wonderful things that are happening in the world around us. Plus, there's lots of in-person events that are happening over the weekend and into half term that you can go to with your family wherever you are in Nottinghamshire. Tickets for all of the different events are starting to book up, so make sure you get yours now. But before that, let's get on with today's show and what an exciting show we've got for you. We're going to learn everything from what different parts of our brain control what to why we need to improve batteries and make them more green. We've got more challenges for you and curious demonstrations, but first up, what small wakes up early and I'll give you one more clue there are lots of them in Nottingham it's wagtails these beautiful birds are no bigger than the size of your hand and they have big white bellies but they might wake you up early on summer mornings here's some tricks on how you might be able to spot them in Nottingham <laughs>
I always wondered what those birds were in and around the forest, and now we know. There's some really great places to look for birds um, in Nottingham, and I love that uh, Sarah's videos always are very much about urban nature and show us that we can really see birds even if we live in flats or if we live um, somewhere right in the city centre. Um, there's also lots of amazing nature reserves across Nottinghamshire uh, where you can have a really good close-up look at birds like uh, um, Colic Woods or Sherwood Forest or really anywhere along the River Trent. So a really good idea to get out and have a look at some birds. So what could you do to try and see more birds where you are? You could head to one of the places that Megan just suggested, or you could look out for them on a walk or in the garden. You could even try and make a DIY little bird feeder. I challenge you to spot five different types of birds before the festival is up. Now, we're very lucky that we are in Nottinghamshire, a home to so much research and discovery and people trying to uncover things that we never even knew before. This includes the scientists at the University of Nottingham, where they've been researching into batteries. Now, batteries are what we have in all electrical devices, whether it be a mobile phone, laptop, walkie-talkie, and they're what powers the device. We went along to ask the scientists what batteries are and how they're helping make them better for the planet. I'm sure everyone has heard of batteries, but do we really know what a battery is? Batteries are electrochemical devices which store chemical energy and convert this into electricity. We most commonly encounter these in devices such as mobile phones and laptops. Batteries are a great way of making devices easily transportable without a need for mains electricity. What's wrong with the batteries we are currently using? The most common batteries we use today are the lithium ion batteries, which were made by scientists who have now won the Nobel Prize. These batteries have changed our society by allowing devices to become more portable and are helping to change the transport sector. However, they are reaching their energy limits. They have poor lifespans and experience significant deterioration in performance within the first few years. They are also not very sustainable because these batteries use very rare materials such as cobalt. This is causing cobalt supplies, which is a key element in the lithium ion battery, to rapidly diminish. Also, the use of these metals means these batteries are heavy and this is not very useful when we want devices to be light and easily portable. We want to produce a lighter and more sustainable battery system which provides more energy than the current lithium ion. Research into new battery technologies has increased because of the global warming crisis and depleting reserves of fossil fuels. Therefore, we are looking for renewable energy storage solutions. Battery technology may be the key to sustainable energy transition by decarbonising the transportation sector while providing a critical storage solution for intermittent solar and wind generation. This means a high energy and sustainable alternative is needed. What's the alternative? Despite there being various possibilities, a lot of the research we're doing involves looking into lithium sulphur. These promise significantly longer use for cell phones to electric vehicles on a single charge, while being more environmentally sustainable to produce than the current lithium ion batteries. There are many advantages to using sulphur, including it holds more energy per unit weight and is a lot lighter than cobalt so the weight of the battery is considerably reduced. However, the lifespan of these batteries is much shorter than their lithium ion counterparts. As scientists, our research is vital in trying and testing various systems to find the best possible one. In research labs, we work on perfecting the chemistry on a small scale before scaling up while trying to utilise reusable parts and limit waste. As you may know, in science, repeats are vital in ensuring the battery system is reliable and results are reproducible. Also, it is crucial in developing a battery that runs efficiently, has a long lifespan and a short charging time. How can we make batteries greener and more sustainable? This will involve thinking about the full life cycle, including the whole manufacturing process and end of life of the chemicals we design. This includes delivery and components, as well as limiting waste and the use of reusable parts.
Well, it sounds like they're part of the way there, but I do really hope that they find a way to sort out batteries for the future so that we can use them in a more sustainable way. Yeah, we talk a lot about being sustainable on the show because it's so important. Well, what does it really mean being sustainable? Well, it means continuing to do, use and make things without harming the environment. So an example of this is reduce, reuse and recycle. So instead of throwing away plastic bottles in a bin bag by putting them in the recycling, that means that they can be taken off to somewhere called a recycling centre so that it can be sorted out and the material used again. So it's nearly time for our first break, but before we do, let's have another round of Guess, Guess That Sound! <laughs> so if you remember yesterday, we had the sound of a chimpanzee. Well, let's see if you can tell what the animal is today. <laughs> let's hear it one more time. That's that a lot harder than yesterday. So do was. you know what the sound is? Let's find out after the break. The I've been a UNICEF ambassador for 18 years, and I've been sent to some extreme humanitarian emergencies from the Congo to Afghanistan. Believe me, the people suffering the most in all of them were the children. Today, the war in Yemen is putting over 12 million children in danger. Many children are so sick and malnourished that without food, water, and basic health care, they could die. So we ask, what can we do? We have to do something, one thing we could do is search UNICEF Yemen online or text HELP to 83080 to find out how you can help. Just five pounds could help provide life-saving food to feed a child for a week. I have seen UNICEF's work for myself in extreme emergencies. It saves lives and it saves childhoods. We must act now. I'm pleading with you to give from your hearts. Search UNICEF Yemen online or text HELP to 83080 and help save a child's life today. With Post Office Over 50's Life Cover, you can have the time of your life. Safe in the knowledge will pay out money when your time is up. UK resident, 50 to 80, your guaranteed acceptance. No health checks and from just £1.15 a week. Plus, you'll even get to choose a £100 gift card. Call Post Office now on 0800 171 And welcome back to the Curiosity Show. Now, before the break, we asked you to guess what animal makes this sound. <laughs> Did you guess it? It's a turkey. Well done if you got that right at home. Have you ever wondered what it's like to be a scientist? Well, we spoke to Anjani Kumari, who's a geneticist, and we asked her some questions about what she does in her job. Because I was always intrigued by research, new things always seemed exciting to me. It's in a rare disease called myotonic dystrophy. So, if I had to give it a very simple example, I can't control my voluntary reflexes. So if I'm holding a door open, I can't let go of the door very easily. So, I wake up and even in my dreams I'm thinking about my experiments and what I have to do next day and then I come to lab, plan my experiments and do other, so other sort of things and I try to finish by 6 every day and you know just go to gym and go home. <laughs> so an interesting fact would be there is no cure for the disease and the person who actually found the gene responsible for the disease is my supervisor. The unexpected surprises when you're doing an experiment and you don't know how it's gonna turn out and it, when it works in your favor, that's the most rewarding experience. That we are nerds, we are not. <laughs> Finding a PhD position, especially in a foreign country because I'm an international student, then getting the scholarship, I would be probably I don't know to be honest, I've never thought about that. <laughs> Things that I never thought I can do, and then when I see it, I'm like, okay, that's just, it's unbelievable to me. In this stellar.
We've got lots of different scientists talking to us throughout the week so we can find out what they like about their jobs and what it's really like to be a scientist. Now, sticking on the topic of biology as we look at biodiversity. Now, biodiversity is the different kinds of life that you can find in an area. This can be everything from animals, plants, birds and trees to bacteria, tadpoles or even the little mushrooms that you sometimes find in forests. All of these species work together in an ecosystem where they're all interconnected. And actually, we're really lucky because there's a new display put on at Woolerton Hall's Natural History Museum that's all about biodiversity, so we can learn even more. Let, let's take a look at the new gallery. Curator of biology here, and uh, this gallery is the one we've uh, recently opened, uh, which is all about uh, biodiversity. And in particular, um, it's concentrating on looking at uh, extinction, you know, things getting uh, rarer, uh, sadly, mainly due to human activities. So uh, we've put, you know, uh, for the rarer animals, some text to accompany them to explain why they're getting rare or why they've gone in, in the case of this passenger pigeon completely extinct. Um, this was actually the commonest bird on the planet um, until uh, the, the 1800s when they started to be shot in huge numbers because they were thought to be uh, agricultural pests in North America where they lived. And from being three to four billion in numbers, uh, the last one died in Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. Um, this is a Victorian specimen that we've had in the museum for a long time and uh, our taxidermist renovated it and uh, here it is on display. There is some good news in, in all this talk of extinction because uh, this wonderful object here which is called Neptune's, uh, Neptune's Cup it's actually a sponge, but you can see why it's called Neptune's Cup because um, it does look like a drinking vessel and um, it was thought to have gone extinct in the early 1900s, so well over 100 years ago, because none had been seen um, for many years. And uh, it, it had been collect, over collected for use as, um, as fonts for christening babies in and uh, for baby baths. Um, and also, of course, sadly for museum collections, <laughs> because they were such unusual looking um, objects. Uh, but in 2011, uh, over a hundred years since they were last seen, um, a couple were rediscovered in uh, deep water off the coast of Thailand and Singapore. And uh, since then a few more have been found, there are about seven or eight that are known now, and they're being very strictly protected. And so hopefully this, uh, this wonderful sponge will, will once again um, be able to be uh, seen by divers and uh, on, on camera. Another conservation success story is the kakapo. Uh, this flightless um, New Zealand parrot used to be very common on mainland New Zealand. Um, it used to nest in burrows in the ground because they didn't fly. Uh, but sadly, when humans introduced rats, cats and stoats to New Zealand when they settled there, uh, these animals uh, unfortunately ate both the uh, the baby uh, kakapos and their eggs and they sadly became almost extinct on the mainland. The remaining few birds were actually taken by conservationists to several offshore islands uh, where the nests there were very closely monitored with cameras and everyone made sure there were no introduced pests on these islands. Um, and the numbers of kakapo have now gone up to 201. Uh, being the latest count. So uh, again another conservation success story for this amazing bird. It's not just uh, birds amongst which there are conservation success stories. Uh, the tiger of course is a very good example of a mammal that was in serious trouble some years ago uh, because of hunting and loss of habitat. Uh, but today thanks to conservation efforts. There are over 3,000 tigers in the wild in India, Nepal and other parts of, uh, of Asia. This, this one was uh, actually uh, a Victorian specimen that the museum uh, possessed 
and it had obviously been done for the tourist trade. Um, its head looked very uh, unreal, it had staring eyes, it looked really awful. Um, and so our taxidermist completely took it to pieces and uh, took the skull out and uh, made a mould of the head and stretched the skin, which he, what we call relax, it softened it with special chemicals and uh, stretched the new skin over the, 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 the mould and made it look like a real tiger again. And a conservation success story with a mammal closer to home in Nottinghamshire is the beaver. Uh, beavers were lost entirely from uh, Britain because of um, overhunting. Um, and they've been introduced successfully to several places now, including here in Nottinghamshire, where the Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust have released some in the Idle Valley. Um, so hopefully beavers are back in Nottinghamshire to stay. And taking pride of place in the new biodiversity gallery is our famous gorilla George. Uh, he's been rehoused in a splendid new case and uh, as you can see he's looking very glad to be back on display to his, uh, his admiring visitors again. And George is now joined in the new gallery by his cousin Ollie the orangutan. Um, so for the first time in, a, in very many years we've got this, uh, this lovely male orangutan renovated and, uh, and on display. Uh, and I'm hoping he's going to become as popular uh, in due course as George has been uh, with our visitors. Uh, orangutans of course are another example of an endangered mammal. Um, in their home in Borneo and Indonesia, uh, they're losing habitat because of palm oil plantations replacing the rainforest in which they live. So uh, yet again, they're very much in need of, uh, of conservation and habitat protection. So we hope our new biodiversity gallery will give our visitors um, an idea of what uh, an amazing planet uh, we have in terms of wildlife and habitats. Uh, our other galleries in the museum too, such as our new bird gallery and fish gallery, show the diversity of those groups of, of animals as well. Uh, and we hope our visitors will be encouraged to pr help protect uh, the planet's diversity for future generations. Thanks so much to the guys at Williston Hall for showing us around their new biodiversity gallery. Remember, you can get down to Williston Hall for the festival event that's going to be there this Saturday. So now we've got another demonstration um, this, um, over on this side. We're going to be showing you how to make a Mobius strip. And you can do this at home really, really easy. All you need is a very long piece of paper. You need a pen. You need some tape. I've got masking tape and a pair of scissors. So um, um, the Mobius strip was ne is named after um, German astronomer and mathematician August Ferdinand Mobius, who dis was one of the people who discovered uh, this trick. Um, so what I've done there is I've taken the piece of paper and I've folded one, one end over and taped it to the other side. So now instead of being one piece of paper with two sides, I've got one piece of paper in a loop that's only got one side. Now, maybe you don't believe me, but I will show you that it's all one side by taking my pen and drawing all over one side without taking my pen off the paper. I'm going to keep going and keep going and you'll see that it's just one side of paper. I'm going to keep going. And now you can see that I've joined up and it's just, I didn't take my pen off the paper, not even once. Um, and the other thing that you can do with the Mobius strip is if you take a, a pair of scissors and you cut in kind of two thirds, and then if we cut all the way along, something very exciting is going to happen. And remember, if you like doing these kinds of activities at home, you should really check out our Australian friends who have their own curiosity show and are uploading lots of activities like this to their YouTube channel. There's loads of really, really exciting stuff. OK, I'm almost there with my cutting. And once I get to the end, you will see. I now have one long side and one small side and they're connected. Now what's the Mobius strip used for? If you've, well, if you think about it, if you've got one long strip of, 
whatever material it is and you can you've got both sides that you can use so if you, you have for example a conveyor belt um, you're using both of the sides rather than just one side and it will last much longer so they're often used in conveyor belts um, now Lara is going to show us around the curiosity board for for this afternoon so if you remembered yesterday, we've got the curiosity board, which we're adding to throughout the week um, so that we know all of the exciting things that we've learned. So I've stuck a few on now. We looked at wagtails with their big white bellies earlier and we met a genetic scientist. We've also got a battery. And later on in the show, we're going to look at the superhuman brain and the taxidermic process. Still to come, we're going to go over to Kilisic Junior School, who are looking after their brains. Watson, Director of Watson's Estate Agents, and this is Francesca, Angelina, John and Laura. We're going to be giving you our top five tips for selling your home. <music> Tip one, get your ducks in a row. Uh, start by having a look online, get in a feel for what's out there in the market. Uh, a lot of properties are selling before they even get online, so I would advise you to register with a good local estate agent to get advance notice on uh, some of these properties that are, are going to be coming onto the market, get a good flavour for it. Then ask them out to do a valuation on your own property and that's going to give you a good feel on uh, what your budget might be going forward and also that a good reliable local estate agent will have access to a good um, independent mortgage advisor and they will also uh, give you a good sense of your affordability. Tip number two is choose the right estate agent. So it's really important you get this right, have a look around the area and online, see who's selling the most properties in your area and they'll be the agent that will normally have the most buyers on their database. So that's a really good place to start from because you can get viewings even before you get yours online. Um, also think about are they on social media using that, it's a really good tool. Are they on all the major web portals and when are they available to speak to my buyers? Okay, top tip number three is prepare your property. Curb appeal is really important for a first impression to a buyer. So little things like take the car off the driveway to show the space. If there is any clutter, you can see a bit of garden waste there, just put it away in the bin and, and certainly keep the bin out of view as best you can. So come inside, there'll be some more tips. Okay, so another good first impression, quite a light, spacious hallway. Shoes are all out of the way with a shoe cupboard there, so that's good. As we go through, we've got little Jesse here. Not ideal um, as a distraction when you're trying to show people your home, so uh, try and keep pets out of the way as best you can. So kitchens are a really important room in the house. It can be very costly if you feel it needs replacing and you can't afford it. There is actually an option that you might not be aware of of just recovering the cupboard doors, and that can be done on a budget. So that's worth thinking about. But this one's really nice, simple, uncluttered, nice smells of coffee or bread in the background is always, it's a cliche but it's true, um, but a really important thing is before you think about getting the property on the market, if you are aware of any damp or electrical issues, it's really important you get that sorted first because that's the number one thing that will put buyers off. So my top tip to you would be to work with your estate agents and communicate we're a proactive agent and before your property's hitting the property portals such as Rightmove and Zoopla, we're already mailing it out to thousands of registered buyers that we have on our database. These are your hottest buyers ready to trot. So we need you to communicate, check that your emails aren't going to your junk folder and answer that phone and be flexible with any viewings. My top tips for completing the sale of your home are completing your fixtures and fittings form as quickly as possible. Decide what you're leaving at the earliest stage. Secondly, I would choose a solicitor that has a good working relationship with your estate agent as this is most important in getting the transaction to be as smooth as possible. And lastly, as eager as you are, please do not book your removals until a date is confirmed as until you exchange contracts, their date is not legally binding.
welcome back to the Curiosity Show, where we're exploring all exciting things about science and the world around us. One really important thing about the world around us is us. And sometimes we might forget how important it is to look after ourselves, especially when we're busy caring for others. That means looking after our bodies, but also looking after our minds. The children at Kilisic Junior School have been learning all about how our different parts of our brain affect behaviour. They're going to show us some things we can do to stay calm when we're feeling a little bit nervous or worried. We are the Kilisic Resilience Leaders at Kilisic Junior School and we are here to inform you on the brain. It is very important to know how to become calm when we get stressed, so we will now inform you on the brain. The lizard is a very important part of the brain. It is in charge of keeping you safe. It keeps us alive by controlling our basic needs like eating, sleeping and breathing. It is the lower part of the brain. Chimp is a part of the brain that comes out and creates emotions um, and it can be very excitable and happy or sad and angry. Um, but that is okay because sometimes we can keep control over it by um, our superhero part of the brain and um, we can keep it under control by using some of our tools. The superhero brain is the hero of the brain. Sometimes the chimp can get out of control so the superhero can help it. The superhero problem solves the problems that the chimp is going through. Here are some of our most efficient strategies for when you are feeling unhappy. Take your hand and make it like a star. Choose a finger from the other hand. Place it on your thumb. Go up breathe, and then breathe in. Go down and breathe out. So go to your um, second finger. Breathe in. Breathe out. Go to your third finger. Breathe in. Breathe out. Go to your fourth finger and breathe in, then breathe out, then to your fifth finger, breathe in and breathe out. We are going to be doing the bunny breathing. Sit up straight, lean forward, put your head forward, breathe in, breathe out. And now we're going to breathe in three times really fast as fast as you can and then we're going to breathe out a really slow breath. Let's do that again. I should sniff in three times really quickly. Breathe out with one slow big breath. Imagine a little bee flying from flower to flower. Breathe in. Breathe out and let your shoulders drop down. As you breathe in, make the um, letter M and all whilst humming. Mm. This is the brain that we have made. So, the pink part of the brain is the lizard brain. The scientific name for the lizard brain is the brain stem. It is your survival brain and your fight and flight brain. It controls the heart, your digestion and your breathing. So this part is the chimp and um, the scientific name is the limbic system and we have the feeling brain, the memory alarm centre, emotions, automatic thoughts and social. This part is the superhero brain. The scientific word is the neocortex. It's the thinking brain, the creative brain, the self-control brain, self-problem brain, the facts brain, the rational thinking brain, and the observant brain. The superhero helps the chimp to calm down. 
The superhero is the most important part of the brain because it helps the chimp to calm down and the lizard. We help people to calm down and solve their problems. We help people if they're feeling anxious or angry in any way. Normally it's just things that help them to calm down or finding solutions for their problems. Yes. Yes. It feels really calm and nice. It feels very rewarding because um, a lot of people don't normally have the ability to calm down and that's also why I like being a resilience leader because I can help people have that skill. It's amazing, those are our stars at Killisick Junior School who have been teaching us how to calm down when we feel a little bit anxious. And Jackie and Claire join me now in the studio. And you're from Positively Empowered Kids, but you've been working with the resilience leaders at Killisick Junior. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Absolutely, I've been working with that school for quite a number of years, a very forward thinking school. And the resilience leaders are just incredible, what they achieve. Um, but for us, it's about teaching a group of young people to become teachers. But by doing, for doing that, we've got to educate them in, first of all, the neuro neuroscience that you've just seen, to help them grow really strong minds through their mindset, but also knowing what to do when we have these big emotions and how to help them navigate through that. And why is that so important? Because it gives us a, such a better place to start from so uh, we're happier we can manage those difficulties that that happen and with the rising cases in mental ill health in children it just gives them a better chance in life to be able to yes as I said have a happier life I think we're always told to you know look after the planet more and look after others and care for others but we've kind of learned that it is more important to look after ourselves and what can kids do to make their mental health kind of stronger and more positive Lots and lots of things. You've seen some, a couple of the techniques that the children shared, but it is really, really important for them to be more self-aware so they can be, understand how they're feeling, but also then help others to do the same. Some kids are kind of more laid back and other kids are kind of run riot. I know I was when I was a kid. So why do you think the children have taken to this so well and kind of just relaxing um, into what you're doing? Well, we've all got to have some kind of emotions toolkit and for children to be able to discover what it is that really helps them is important. So they've got to look at what are the things they love, what are the things that are going to help them calm down when life gets difficult. It's different for everybody and it works so well because they're finding what works for them and, and that's going to make such a difference. Definitely, Jackie. And Claire, you've come in today, I believe, and hopefully to show us one of the techniques that we can do if we are feeling a little bit stressed or anxious. Can you talk me through that? I can, absolutely. So, as we say, different children respond to different needs um, and different things. And I really like to work visually with children and hands-on because that learning is really important. So, we're going to use a balloon. I've got one here. Um, you've got your balloon there. I have. Um, and I'm, <laughs> I'm going to show excited. you what we can do. So, if you've got one around the house, um, if not, you can imagine it. But it's really great if you've got the physical there so I'm going to hand that to you thank you okay so what we're going to do is if you've got any um, emotions that you don't want to hold on to any unhelpful feelings that are going on we're going to blow all of those emotions into our balloon so okay you. all right so just as you do that imagine that and you can blow that up you know, fairly big if you want to. So they're all my emotions and they're that. all in there. So <laughs> there's a few things that you can do with this. Um, you can obviously pop a balloon. Um, that's not great because actually that represents an explosion of emotions. So that might be an outburst of anger, um, you know, for a child that doesn't know what to do with their emotions. And it's not kind to everyone around us, so it's a really great teaching moment for children. We could tie that balloon up and keep all of those emotions contained, but by doing that, we're holding on to those emotions. We're not actually releasing them, and we know that that can cause us to be unwell, um, you know, not support our mental health. 
So the thing that I like to do with it is to actually release them. So Maybe. we're going to do. Oh, countdown. I've accidentally let some out of mine already. I'm again. sorry about that. Oh, a bit more up. Okay, okay. So we are going to let them go. We're going to do a countdown from three okay. to one. We're going to say let it go, and then we're going to let it float. Let's away do room. it. Three, Three, two, two one, let, let it go. go. Oh, mine went over there somewhere, I <laughs> So think. what you've got there is all those emotions that have escaped out of the balloon into the environment. They're no longer ho holding on to us. We can let them go. And also, it's good fun, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, the laughter, the sound of the balloon, Definitely. the movement, it all helps to help our mental health. Well, I'm really sorry, Claire. I'm going to have to <laughs> cut you off there. Jackie and Claire from Positively Empowered Kids. I believe Megan might have a little challenge for us now. Now we've got another microscope image from the School of Life Science Imaging Facility at the University of Nottingham. Um, we're going to flash it up now and see if you can guess what you think it is. Now, this is a very bright image and a bit different from the one we had yesterday. So get your thinking caps on and we'll let you know what it is after the break. The really irritates me? Ordinary pads and tampons full of plastic and chemicals. You know what doesn't irritate me? Organic pads, tampons and liners. O-R-G-A-N-Y-C. They're clinically proven to protect my sensitive skin with 100% certified organic cotton. And they provide unsurpassed absorbency too. Organic. O-R-G-A-N-Y-C. The only clinically proven feminine care brand. Hmm, what a comforting thought. Hello, I'm Helen and I'm Kerry and we run the Little London Herbal Stores and we're here to give you our five top winter health tips. My top tip for looking after my skin during the winter is to use the Willida Skin Food. I like to use this on my elbows, on my hands when they're chapped and also for flip-flop season in the summer when you get the hard skin on your heels. It's a really, really thick cream that goes in lovely. It's not for everyday use, but for everyday, we've got the Skin Food Body Lotion, which you can use all over after your shower, and the Skin Food Light, which goes under your makeup. My next top tip is to take the Immune Boost Tablet by Nature's Plus. It's a one a day tablet that contains your vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin C and mushrooms to help keep your immune system healthy and keep away colds and flus. And did you know that some mushrooms are really good for helping increase your immune system and also helping with respiratory issues? So this is my favourite top tip and this is Echinacea in a hot drink. Echinacea is really good for boosting the immune system and fighting coughs and colds. All you need to do is pop a teaspoon of the liquid in a cup, pour on boiling water, and you've got a really soothing, comforting drink that's going to have a lot of health benefits. Another of my top health tips is to take vitamin D liquid. Vitamin D is important all year round, but especially during the winter months, as we don't get it from the sunshine. I like the liquid version better because it seems to be easier absorbed and it also tastes quite nice. And it's a bit different from taking a tablet every day. So, this is my top tip for sore throats. This is really, really good if you've got a sore throat. You just rip the top off and drink the contents and it coats your throat, it coats the mucous membranes. It's, it's not horrible like a lot of preparations that you use. It's quite um, lemony, minty sort of thing, but it really takes away the sore throat quickly. Your 
Welcome back. Now, before the break, we showed you a picture of an item that some scientists in Nottingham have been looking at this week. They've been using a microscope to look at these materials, which shows a really, really zoomed in version of the thing that they're looking at. What do you think it could be? Did you manage to guess it at home? Here's it one last time. It's a cheese board. Now, you might see a lot of these at Christmas or even when you're having a party. We're coming close to the end of today's show now, but we still have a few more bits of curiosity to show you. Next up, we're going to meet Sarah, who's a taxidermist. She works to preserve animals so we can learn more about their bodies. She works at Woolerton Hall, and if you've visited, you've probably seen some of her work on display. We headed over to the studio she works in to find out more about this amazing job. Do you want me to introduce myself? Yeah, please, yes. Are we going? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, my name's Sarah Burhouse. I'm a freelance taxidermist and I do some work as a natural history restorer. I'm just going to talk about how, um, how we actually do the taxidermy process. Um, so here I've got this maquette, which um, is something that I use to show people how to preserve a bird. Um, so first off, you have to have a bird that's in good enough condition to um, to mount. So that means that it's it's died fairly recently, or when it when it did pass away, it was frozen as quickly as possible, um, preferably within 24 hours, uh, depending on the temperature outside. Um, what would you would do at first is that you would get your bird, you would take all of the measurements that you can that you can take from it um, before you've done anything to it, which involves injecting the eyes to inflate them, um, measuring the eyes, making sure that you have some artificial eyes that will fit the bird, um, and then you can you can begin to work on it once you have all the measurements you need. That involves taking the skin off. It's really not as disgusting as people often think it is. Um, people expect me to be taking out entrails and all sorts of things, but actually it's um, it's much more like just taking the skin off of an orange. Um, everything, everything that's disgusting really is contained within a membrane. So uh, we take the skin off. Um, we do have to clean out the skull. Um, so once we get to this stage, we'll clean out the skull. Um, we also have to clean these bones. So you'll see on the maquette that there are some, some bones present. Um, we, we remove the femur bone on the leg, but we keep the rest of the bones. Um, and those are cleaned and preserved with a bone paste um, until we then um, we get rid of everything else. So all of the biological tissue that would decompose, we get rid of that. All we're keeping is the skin and those few bones. Um, we then make a replica of the body that was taken out using this blue foam, so this stuff. I carve it down using the measurements that I've taken from the body to create the form, um, and that's this. And then we thread wires along the bones, and they attach the bones to the form. Um, so these are the artificial eyes that I mentioned, and basically this is exactly...
So to close the show today, we're going to have a bit of fun with balloons. I'm going to show you three different tricks. We've already had one trick earlier today from Jackie and Claire about playing with balloons, but we've got three more here for you today. Now I've got this ginormous balloon, and what I'm going to do is show you how static electricity works. So I'm going to rub it on my hair like this, and when I do this, I'm building up <laughs> lots of electricity. And if I pull my hair apart, you can see my hair stuck to the balloon. And why that's happening is the balloon gets a positive charge on it and my hair has a negative charge. So when I pull them together, it pulls the hair and they, they want to attract to each other. So that's a fun one that you can do at home. I'm going to ping this one across the studio now. And I'm going to show you my other one. And now here I've got a balloon on a skewer. Who'd have thought that you could do this? So I'm going to show you how this works by blowing up my balloon. Now, I don't have any special types of balloons. It's very ordinary balloons that we bought from the shop. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie uh, a knot in that, and then I'm going to poke my skewer through the bottom. And now, at the bottom of the balloon, the air pressure is lower than at other parts of the balloon. So it can take the poke going through. And the same at the other end. You can see I can put that on my balloon. It's going to come through at some point. <laughs> and I'm going to get that onto my skewer. And my last one, my last trick, I'm going to show you how if I pop a balloon like this, it's just going to pop normally. <gasps> but if I get another balloon and I put them on pins that are lots and lots and lots of pins, uh, and I blow up another balloon, I'm going to tie a knot in that one as well. And then if I put my balloon on top of lots of these pins, you would think that it would pop just like the other one does. But if I put it on there like this and I press down, you can see that it doesn't pop. And that's because the pressure on the balloon is now dispersed across all of the, all of the pins. So not one pin has enough pressure to pop my balloon. So there we go. Um, that's, that's how you can have fun with balloons. Shall I pop my balloon one more time? Yeah. OK, here we go. <gasps> uh, and now back over to Lara. Lots of balloons on today's show. Don't really know where that came from. Well, that's all we've got time for today. But don't worry if you want to get involved with the Festival of Science and Curiosity even more. We've got so, much, so many events, so much to do on our website. So head over there, www notsfosac.co.uk don't want to get that wrong and on our socials notsfosac we want to see all mobius strips and all of your balloon tricks so make sure that you hashtag curious knots so that megan and i can see what you've been up to we'll see you at the same time same place tomorrow bye, bye.